So this section is titled uh, Radiation Perspective. So again, we're trying to get a perspective, a point of view on what radiation is and how, again, how it fits into our daily lives. So um, let's start off with a couple important things. Um, some notes on the radiographer's job, right? The radiographer, the x-ray tech is the person charged with um, producing images, right? We're producing images of the body by using a form of radiation that we are going to learn can be harmful, not only to other, uh, not only to ourselves, the radiographers, but to the patients and the general public, right? So we want to try to understand that. So this is from the ARRT Code of Ethics. This is uh, number seven in the Code of Ethics. So you can read from your Code of Ethics or you can read right off, right off of here. But it says the radiologic technologist uses equipment and accessories, employs techniques and procedures, and performs services in accordance with an accepted standard of practice. So we're trying to adhere to a, some standard of practice. We demonstrate expertise in limiting the radiation exposure to the patient, self, and other members of the healthcare team, right? And that's our job, right? To produce images uh, within, under an acceptable standard of ethics, to use our equipment, produce images, and to do that by using the minimal amount of radiation to the patients, ourselves, and again, the, the general public, as well as the healthcare team. Number five in the Code of Ethics tells us, the radiologic technologist assesses situations, exercises care, discretion, and judgment. This is important. Assumes responsibility for professional decisions. This is also important. Acts in the best interest of the patient, right? So that's, that's what you're doing, right? You're trying to, to do your job, but acting in the best interest of your patient. That's what you should always be thinking when you're making your images, right? when you're producing images, when you're using radiation to make images, you're doing the best you can to produce the best images you can with the least exposure to your patients, right? Taking the, the uh, uh, best, thinking of the best interest, what's in the best interest of your patients. Okay. So those are the two kind of important notes from the Code of Ethics, but again, I gave you the entire Code of Ethics. Um, great, so let's move forward. Let's take a look at, at some of this other stuff to build, again, a good pers perspective on radiation. Um, some of you may know that um, x-rays were discovered in 1895. Okay, November 8th, 1895. And that's not necessarily the subject today. We're not going to talk about when x-rays were discovered, but you should know that x-rays were discovered the late 1800s. By 1896, so let me backtrack. X-rays were discovered in, in Germany. Okay, uh, a physicist named Wilhelm Rentgen, 1895 discovers, late 1895 discovers x-rays. By Early the next year, early 1896, the word had gotten around the world, okay, and the other smart people around the world were starting to make and, and use x-ray tubes, x-ray machines, okay? So by 1896, Thomas Edison gets his hand on an x-ray machine, okay? Um, now, the x-ray machines that they had were a little bit different than the ones we have, right? Um, but the sim same similar concepts. The concept, the conceptual, like the way we produce x-rays hasn't necessarily changed in its principle since 1895 when Rankin discovers them, okay? But less than a year later, Thomas Edison gets his hands on an x-ray machine, x-ray tube. Um, he calls it a fluoroscope, okay, for important reasons. And um, he has a lab assistant named Clarence Daly, okay? You can see... Edison and Daly here. This is a picture of the two of them. Edison is the one looking through that view box, that little viewfinder thing, and Daly is the one with his hand on the on top of that cardboard box, or that, sorry, that wooden box. That wooden box houses the X-ray tube, okay, and um, that view box has a fluorescent screen in it, okay. So you, you can imagine, right? If the X-ray tube, the thing that produces X-rays, the thing that makes the X-ray beam, is down here. It, the x-rays will go in all directions. Now, this is 1896. We didn't have, um, so for us that have been here for a while, you know, we, we sort of, we can cone down our x-ray beam. We can control our x-ray beam and only shoot it in one direction, right? Well, back then, they didn't have that. The x-ray machine, the tube, the thing that produced x-rays, for you guys who are new to us, it's kind of like a light bulb, okay? The thing that produces the x-rays, as you know, a light bulb sends light in all directions, right? The same is true of an x-ray tube if it's not collimated, if it's not controlled. This is not controlled. This is just a box around a thing that produces x-rays, okay? And the x-rays go in all directions. So they travel in all directions, 
towards his gonads, towards his gonads, through his hand, okay? And the x-rays are going to come up through this, the uh, Dali's hand, and in this box here, there's a, a fluorescent screen, a screen that lights up when the x-rays hit it, okay? And so looking through that screen, inside of that uh, this, you know, um, cone, there's, it's sort of dark inside of there, and then at the bottom there's a screen. And the x-rays pass through Dali's hand, hit this screen, and what you can see on this fluorescent screen, looking through the viewfinder like Edison is doing, you can see an outline, a shadow, of the bones inside of Clarence Dali's hand. So this is some of the first experimentation done with x-ray. Okay? He called it a fluoroscope because it used a fluorescent screen to see things. Fluoro, fluoro for fluorescent screen, scope for seeing things, okay, for being able to see something, right? Um, good, so this is Edison invents the fluoroscope right after Röntgen invents x-rays. Uh, fluoroscopy can be thought of nowadays as video x-ray. It's kind of like x-ray, but not still images like that. It's, it's moving, dynamic images, fluoroscopy. Edison invents fluoroscopy. Um, <clears throat> however, um, you'll learn in a moment here that um, Clarence Daly, if you read the chapter, you learned this, but Clarence Daly, um, he was the lab assistant for Edison. So he was constantly finding himself putting his body parts, specifically his hands, right on top of the x-ray machine, okay, the x-ray tube. Okay? Clarence Daly is credited as being the first person to die from radiation exposure. Okay? And he dies in 1904. That's you know, eight years later, a little less than eight years later, but we'll call it about eight years, okay? After, the, after they started to use radiation, uh, x-ray machines, fluoroscopy, Clarence Daly dies within eight years. He doesn't die from a car accident or falling off a cliff or something like that. He dies from radiodermatitis, cancer caused by radiation exposure, okay? So this is Clarence Daly on the left, a picture of him. On the right is a picture of his hands at some intermediate point of his treatments, okay? Now the treatment for radiation, um, sorry, for skin cancer back then was to lop off that part of the body, okay? To just cut it off, okay? So uh, Daly had his hands amputated entirely before he died, okay? And portions of his arms amputated entirely before he died. So this is like a midpoint um, of, of his, of his uh, deterioration, okay? Um, and he is, again, as I said, the first person whose death is attributed to a radiation, to radiation exposure specifically, okay? Um, good. So, not good, but good. We, we learned that there's a person who is the first one, right? Someone's got to be the first one to, to uh, have something adverse happen to them when we learn something new, right? That's sort of how science works. We learn things and then we set up new, new guidelines and things like that to prevent it from happening in the future, but, you know, we don't, we're not proactive necessarily, right? We're sort of retroactive in the way we, 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 um, we keep people safe, right? Something bad happens to somebody and we make sure it doesn't happen again in the future, right? That's the idea. Did they know that, that no. exactly what caused it? Oh, they knew, they, they inferred that it was the, due to the radiation eventually. But, um, you know, as it's happening, you don't know, right? You know, 1895, Rankin discovered x-rays. We didn't know about radioactivity back then. And in fact, Rankin actually discovered x-rays before we knew about natural radioactivity. So you guys know about radioactivity to some extent now. You know, there's things in the world that are radioactive. And, you know, for example, we use them to power certain power plants, nuclear power plants, for example, right? Um, and in, lo in lots of different applications, we use radioactive materials, but we didn't even know about that, right? We didn't know about any forms of ionizing radiation. We didn't know about harmful radiation. We didn't know what it was. 1895, Rentgen invents x-rays. In 1904, Daly's the first person to die, and no one in, the, in that interim learns much because it takes time for this um, accumulated radiation exposure to sort of add up to something bad. Okay, so it wasn't really, it wasn't honestly until the 50s that we really got our, our, our stuff together and started to actually, you know, use really smart radiation safety uh, guidelines that we still follow today. So it took that whole, you know, 50-ish year time frame to sort of do all this experimentation and have people die earlier than they were supposed to and have people have horrible cancers and stuff like that before we started to really learn about um, 
about uh, the, the harms, the potential harms, okay? So uh, we're gonna learn a all about these potential harms, and then I'm gonna remind you at the end of all of this that it's just not as bad as you think, especially nowadays, because we have all these really good guidelines, safety equipment, safety practices, right? It's just not as bad as, it's, as it sounds, but we're gonna start off by making it sound pretty bad, okay? Um, all right, so some other things that are important for us to know, um, you know, by the early 1900s, some people start to recognize that bad things are happening. Again, we just said Daly dies in 1904. This is in the United States, Clarence Daly and Thomas Edison. Um, I didn't mention what Thomas Edison was famous for already. Do you guys know what Thomas Edison's famous for? The light bulb, right? He makes a light bulb that works, okay? Other people made light bulbs, but he makes one that works, right? Uh, that's why everyone knows who Edison is, um, but he's also credited as the inventor in, in radiography. We credit him as the inventor of the fluoroscope, the uh, video x-ray machine. You just saw that in that, that previous picture. Anyways, early 1900s, you have another physician, Dr. Kasabian, okay? And this guy is credited with the first set of rules for radiation protection. Okay, um, he's one of the ones that happens to notice that um, he has skin burns on his hands after working around his x-ray machine. Okay, so he happens to make uh, a correlation, right? When I work around the x-ray machine, I get hurt, okay? And so he makes a correlation with that and he says, well, maybe I should, um, you know, test this, right? So what if I don't put my hands near the x-ray machine? Yeah, how, how does, how, you know, what's my outcome after that? So out of all these experiments that he does, he comes up with 10 rules for radiation protection. And there's some of the rules that we still use today. He says things like, these are not very, these are sort of very specific rules. These are not the general rules that we follow today, like time, distance, and shielding. He says things like, never use your hands to test the intensity of the x-ray beam. You know how you would shine a flashlight and then shine it on your hand to check how bright it is? Is, don't do that with the x-ray machine okay that'll hurt you okay um, now of course the x-ray machines they had back then were unfiltered uncollimated unshielded so there's a bunch of, of things that those x-ray machines a bunch of ways that they were harmful where ours are not as harmful today but that was one thing that he figured out pretty quickly don't put your hands in front of the x-ray beam okay he also documents the deterioration, because he's a good scientist, documents the deterioration of his hands due to radiodermatitis. He realizes it's happening and he documents the, that it happens and he sort of, sort of, sort of lists what happens to himself. Uh, he later dies of metastatic cancer. As you may know, metastatic cancer is the bad kind. It's the kind that spreads around the body, right? So you get cancer in your hands and it spreads to like your brain and your liver and other important parts of your body, okay? So he had skin cancer, cancer from the skin on his hands moved to other places and he dies from that. He comes up finally, and there's 10 rules originally, we don't cover those 10 rules, but he does come up with the rules that we call the cardinal rules of radiation safety. So all of the time when you remember the three cardinal rules of radiation safety, remember there's a person who invented them and he died because he had to learn about them. Okay, so you don't have to die because we already know about them, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So he says, minimize the amount of time you are around the x-ray beam. Minimize the amount of time you're around radiation, right? When possible, increase your distance from the source of radiation. We say maximize your distance, okay? Radiation weakens as it travels away from its source, right? Um, those of us sh who have been here for a minute should know the law for that. What's the law that talks about that? How radiation weakens as it travels away from where it came from. The inverse square law, right? So it'll say something like stand a distance from a source of radiation, you get some exposure, right? Double that distance and the exposure you would receive at twice the distance is one quarter of what it was, right? So it drops four times by just doubling your distance. Okay, that's an inverse square law. We'll learn all about that law again in radiation safety. And this is the reason for it, is because the distance from the source of radiation affects the exposure by a lot. Okay, so maximize your distance. And then lastly, shielding. Okay, use lead shielding in protective structures and apparel. Um, 1895, Rentkin discovers x-rays and in, uh, in late 1895, Rentkin does some experiments to figure out, he discovers x-rays, he goes, all right, there's this thing I'm gonna call the x-ray, right? 
he doesn't know what it is, what it does, how it acts. So he starts to experiment on it, right? And one of the things he does, Rentgen, in his experiments is he puts up sheets of lead in front of the x-ray machine and notices that the x-rays can't pass through the lead to expose whatever's on the other side of it. Photographic plate, fluorescent screen, um, fluorescent crystals. And he notices, though, the beam can't pass through the lead, okay? So he learns x-rays travel in straight lines. They're a form of light, and they, importantly, can't pass through lead. We know nowadays that x-rays have a harder time passing through lead, but there's no such thing as the x-ray beam cannot penetrate lead. It just doesn't penetrate it as easily as other things. But we use lead shielding in our protective structures and apparel. Our rooms are lead lined. Our x-ray rooms are lead lined. The window you look through when you're standing in your control booth making your exposure and your patients in the x-ray room, that's a leaded window, okay? Um, your, of course, shields that the patients wear are made of lead or lead equivalent, something like lead, but equivalent to lead. So there's your radiation safety cardinal principles, time, distance, shielding. Minimize your time, maximize your distance, maximize your shielding, okay? These are the rules to keep you safe, right? Your patients have to be around the x-ray beam, so they you want to do what you can to minimize their exposure, but we want to think about these three things for ourselves, time, distance, shielding. These are the cardinal rules. Okay. Because, yeah, go ahead. So the, like what he was doing, mm -hmm. is, that, is, is that equivalent to us marking up the x-ray machine? I mean, probably worse, okay. right? Because um, without, so you, do you guys know about filtration in the x-ray tubes? Yeah. yeah. What, is, what is filtering and why is it important in the x-ray tube? So let's start with what is filtering. And, and so what's bad in the x-ray beam, the low energy x-rays or the high energy x-rays? The low energy x-rays, right? Those are the ones that are actually more harmful for you. Why are those the more harmful ones? They don't exit the body, they stay in the body. The least energetic x-ray part, part of the x-ray beam stays in the body, so we filter it out. Right. That's why these older x-ray tubes would be more harmful is because um, one, they're higher intensity. Yeah. So it's kind of like having our x-ray tubes maxed out. But then it's also worse because they're not filtering out the low energy stuff because they didn't know to do that yet. Right. Um, and so we do we do that now. We filter out the low energy x-ray. So more of the beam passes through the body in, uh, relative to what it used to do with, with these earlier machines. And so, yeah, filtration is a huge part of this. So that's the that's the, the what and the why right behind filtration. Um, good. Yes. So, even after we filter, yeah, you know, you know modern machines, mm -hmm. do we still get low end X-rays? You get some. Some. Yeah, you you can't perfectly filter the X-ray beam. You can decrease the amount, right? You can decrease the amount of those low energy photons by passing the X-ray beam through the filters, the aluminum filter, the glass of the X-ray tube. Um, so you're just you're decreasing the amount by a lot. You're not completely eliminating all of the low energy X-rays. Yeah, uh, but it's a drastic decrease in exposure to the patients when when that's when that filtering is done. One more time. I didn't realize how big the, the lead panels were. Which lead panels? The they put on, uh, around the room. Oh, like in the walls? Yeah, yeah they're huge, huge I mean, sheets of lead. Yeah. Did, and you got to see it? Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Uh, did they? Were they get a huge roll of, of lead lead sheet? Yeah. It was, it was heavy. yeah. Like yeah, they're, it's huge and heavy, right? Um, so yeah, when you go into our X-ray room, you'll notice um, uh, if you look at the edge of the wall, right? Not the not the face of the wall, but the edge of the wall. You'll notice that you can see like the wood paneling, and there's this dark layer and then some more wood behind it, right? Um, that dark layer is the lead, the lead paneling. It's about a sixteenth of an inch thick of lead. And so it, and it comes in big, big uh, sheets. I think they're like four by eight sheets. They're really like four feet wide sheets. And so they're really, really heavy. Lead, you, you may know lead is heavy, right? And so we know lead aprons are heavy. These big leaded sheets that go in the walls are very, very heavy. So yeah, it takes like, you know, um, they have to make sure that they secure them to the wall properly and all that stuff. There's a lot of considerations in, in, in doing that. But. Door. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the, the, the door has to be leaded, the window, yeah, so um, ni one nice thing though is, you know, uh, th this room is very tall, you know, but um, typical rooms are eight feet tall. Right, um, lead only has to go up to seven feet, so the lead does not have to extend all the way up the wall. Um, so there's some weight savings there, but um, still, it's a lot. It's a lot, a lot of actual lead. Okay, fantastic. So, um, all right. So, 
in the early 1900s, after some people started to die and, and certain physicians, to, and, and who's, who's dying from this, right? It's not the patients, because the patients, you know, um, we, we get patients pretty, pretty early on. We start to use this in a medical application pretty early on. But it's not the patients who are dying, right? It's the physicians who are noticing that think bad things are happening because they're the ones spending all the time right around the x-ray beam, right? So the people that are coming up with these rules are the physicians like this Dr. Kasabian, and he, he, he's one of the ones experiencing the adverse effects. So the physicians are experiencing the adverse effects and, and basically they're experimenting on themselves, right? They're, they're, they're spending time around the x-ray machines and then they're documenting the effects that happen from that and making recommendations for future physicians, okay? Um, and that was a really common thing. It was common before the 50s for radiologists, which is sort of the new type of doctor that sort of came out of the discovery of x-rays, radiologists, were dying earlier than other physicians, okay? And so, you know, we credit people like this guy to, to figuring out these rules of radiation safety and making it now a safe occupation for us. So that's the next thing to learn is, in modern times, radiography is one of the safest occupations, okay? It's no longer, it started off as one of the most dangerous things you could do, right? And now it's one of the safest things you can do for work. Okay, so radiologists, radiographers, we don't die earlier than anyone else because of our work, okay? Other things get us, but not the work that we do, okay? You know, uh, it, it has about the same health risk as working as, a, a, you know, somebody with a desk job, clerk or secretary, okay? So very safe, that's nice. Um, the reason why it's safe though is again as i said because a lot of people sacrifice their health to discover these things right um they didn't know they were sacrificing their health until it was too late but once they realized that they they got into gear and figured out rules how to keep people safe in the future okay such as dr kasabian in that case there are others too there are other important people so the way to think about it nowadays is um have a healthy respect for the potential hazards. The hazards are not from single exposures to radiation. The hazards come from cumulative radiation exposure, right? The hazards from radiation come from being around radiation for your entire career, right? That, if you're around it in, in an unsafe way, that, that poses a risk to you. But following radiation safety guidelines, um, it's just as safe as any other job. So you should have a healthy respect for it, but you should not be afraid of it, okay? And that's, what, that's why radiation safety is important. You know, it's important that you know how to be safe around radiation so that you, you know, don't have, have any adverse fear of it. All right, let's make a couple uh, notes on how people think about medical x-rays the danger of them compared to other um, other things in the world that, that could be dangerous. So um, this this is a comparison. This is a risk survey um, given to three separate groups of people. Okay, um, they talk they ask this, these three separate groups of people about the risk of medical X-rays and a bunch of other things. And the risk of other things, and on the next slide, we'll look at the risk of nuclear power plants. So right now in your head, you should think if you haven't read this already, um, you, you're better. You, you can have a um, uh, you can do this, but if you read it, you know the answer. Um, anyways, think about what, what you think is more dangerous to you, right? Nuclear power plants or medical x-rays? And let's see how these people answered, right? So medical x-rays were on the list of things that are risky. Medical x-rays by the League of Women Voters, which is one group of people, um, say they rank medical x-rays 22nd on the list. They don't say what all the other things are on the list in this study. Um, this study, of course, sh should in principle be able to get looked up. If you go to the textbook, it should be cited somewhere. But anyways, uh, 22nd on the list for medical x-rays by legal women voters. College students rank medical x-rays 17th on the list. And businessmen rank medical x-rays 24th on the list, okay, of, of dangerous things in the world. The actual risk of medical x-rays is in ninth place on the list that they have, which comes after smoking, alcohol, automobiles, handguns, electricity, motorcycles, swimming, and surgery. So after all those things, it's less dangerous than all those things, okay? Um, but it's up there. It's ninth on the list of things. It is in the same ballpark as swimming and surgery and motorcycles and other things, okay? Medical x-rays are, as far as a risky thing. Nuclear power plants, so notice that medical x-rays were ranked very low where they were actually very high on the list, okay? Of things, medical x-rays were ranked low, they came in ninth place. So we, 
misidentified the riskiness of medical x-rays. We underemphasize the risk of medical x-rays. The people in these surveys who are just lay people, regular people, underemphasize the risk of medical x-rays. Nuclear power plants, however, were ranked first. The most dangerous thing to you are nuclear power plants, according to the League of Women Voters. According to college students, nuclear power plants are the most dangerous thing to you. Okay. Um, and according to businessmen, they're the eighth most dangerous thing, eighth most risky thing. The actual place on the list is 20th on the list. So we ranked nuclear power plants very high on the list of dangerous things, where they actually fall very, very low on the risk of dangerous things. 20th place. They are less risky than railroads and flying and construction and bicycles and hunting and home appliances, firefighting, police work, contraceptives. Nuclear power plants are less dangerous than birth control, okay? They're not dangerous. That's the point, right? So people, this is, this, these three groups of people are supposed to be like a representative group, right? You have, you have women, you have men, you have college people, okay? It's supposed to be a representative group of people, okay? And this supposedly representative group of people says nuclear power plants are very dangerous where they in fact are just not, okay? And they say medical x-rays are not very dangerous when in fact they are among the riskier things, okay? So we have a misinformed public, right? We have a, a general population that doesn't understand the risk of medical x-rays and the unriskiness of everything else, okay? So the risk of x-rays is underestimated while that of other things such as nuclear power plants is grossly exaggerated. Um, I'll give it in a second here, it's on the screen, but I'll give a second in an explanation of why, but why do you think people are afraid of nuclear power plants? Movie. Movies, Chernobyl, right? The scary. <laughs> what, the name is scary? It says nuclear in the name, right? We know they, there's the thing called like a nuclear bomb, right? So they got a nuclear power plant and a nuclear bomb. Those nuclear bombs are dangerous. Nuclear power plant must be dangerous, right? Well, no, you can't control it. It, it, it we, has... We can't our level we, we don't we personally like general people don't right, control it right. some like organizations somewhere, someone somewhere, somewhere controls them plant, yeah somebody's pushing the button right yeah now. that's a that's a, Actually, and that's why chernobyl went boom okay so chernobyl is the only power plant to have a a explosive meltdown there's been a couple others there's one in japan and one here in the united states those were very very mild okay <laughs> chernobyl in the mid 80s that was a big deal that was a worldwide catastrophe okay that contaminated the world's drinking water that contaminated the world's air that contaminated huge swaths, swaths of land in eastern europe okay which cannot be you know, lived on now there's a huge area called exclusion zones around chernobyl um that was a big big deal so that's 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 the mid 80s right that's a big problem and so lots of people have um adverse opinions of nuclear power plants because of that one well it turns out that one power plant was old poorly managed um and it, and, it, and it really came down to the day that that happened a bunch of human level errors so that's what you're kind of getting at right there's a person right poking a butt poking at buttons that are important buttons right so in that day it came down to a bunch of human level errors um and and that it, it ended up being a catastrophic outcome because of that right it was a runaway reaction that, that they that they weren't able to slow down the steps they actually took sped up the reaction and made it worse and the power plant went boom that was bad really really not a, not a good thing um and then Prior to that, I believe it's prior to that, if, if I'm remembering right, Three Mile Island, I think, was in the 70s. But anyways, um, in the U.S., the thing that happens in the U.S. that we that, that gets all that gets the hype from this, most people haven't heard about Three Mile Island because we were too young or not alive yet. Um, but the media, you know, media, as they do, news outlets and things like that, um, like to hype things up sometimes for certain reasons, right? And in this case, it was Three Mile Island has a Three Mile Island's the name of a of a place, and they have a power plant. It was a nuclear power plant. This is East Coast, um, and they had a a meltdown. Okay, the power plant had its own little meltdown. Okay, that power plant emitted an amount of radiation. We measure radiation in a unit called the Curie. Okay, um, does that name seem familiar to anybody? The Curie. Who is it given to from? Mary Curie, right? She is uh, a credit has a lot of credits in, in the early discoveries of radiation. Um, 
But anyways, um, it emitted 17 curies of radioactivity. Okay, so that's an amount of radiation. I'll compare that in a little bit to other things, but think, remember 17 curies, not 17 million curies, 17. Do you have a question? Could it also be, because like most people aren't near nuclear power plants, so it's like it's like like that they like That they, possibly. Possibly, yeah, yeah, just on the coast, yep. Um, and um, yeah, it's possible, you know. I mean, I remember I, I grew up here, in, I grew up in Morro Bay, just, you know, one city over, and uh, we did the nuclear power plant meltdown evacuation drills. So we, like, had an understanding. It was just like a fire drill for us, right? So it wasn't scary to us. Now, what do you think is more harmful to your health, a nuclear power plant or a coal fired power plant? Well, now, because I'm asking you the question, you're probably going to say coal, right? Most people would answer nuclear power plant, okay? Did you know that coal-fired power plants emit significantly more radiation than nuclear power plants do, okay? So if you live nearby a coal-fired power plant, you are getting more radiation exposure than if you live nearby a nuclear power plant. Nuclear power plants are actually very, very safe. It's just when the, if something goes wrong, it can go wrong pretty bad. And that's happened basically three times ever. But think about how many power plants there are, right? That it, three times ever, okay. <laughs> All right, so um, let's take a look. Let's build, let's build a, as this next thing is saying, let's build a frame of reference, okay? How to talk, when we think, when we say 17 curies during Three Mile Island, we have to be able to compare that to different things. So I'm going to teach you guys, and, and then in the next lecture, we're going to talk specifically about the units of radiation, right? We know about like the mile and the, the minute and things like that. Those are units of, of measure. We're going to learn about units of measure for radiation, but right now, we're going to learn about um, some basic units of measure that to, way to, ways to talk about radiation. So anyways, uh, to develop a frame of reference, you should know, when we, so, so when we say radiation, we mean, um, in this context, we mean the harmful kind, okay? You may know that the sun gives you harmful radiation, right? What do we call the harmful radiation from the sun? UV, UV rays, ultraviolet radiation, right? You can't see UV rays, can you? Okay, x-rays are very similar, right? You can't see x-rays, they're high energy, you can't see them. Um, there's also natural radioactivity, okay? Uh, unstable atomic nuclei tend to break apart and shoot little pieces of themselves around. That's natural radioactivity. So, all of the time, all of your life, from birth to death, you're being exposed to background radiation. It doesn't matter where you're at on Earth, okay? you're gonna be exposed to natural background radiation. This is the harmful kind, okay? No matter what you do, you're gonna be exposed to harmful radiation. Even if you put on, you know, covered yourself in lead jackets, you are still emitting harmful radiation from inside your body, okay? You have some harmful atomic nuclei in your body that are radioactive. Um, potassium, you have lots of potassium in your body, right? Potassium, one of the forms of potassium is radioactive. Potassium-40, and you have potassium-40 in your body, okay? Um, in any given second of your life, you have about 5,000 radioactive decay events, 5,000 radioactive events happening inside of your body every second, okay? So that's just your body, right? So it doesn't matter what you do. You can't get away from it, okay? Anyways, there is this... One part of one one category of natural radiation that you receive every day is called the background. Okay, this is the radiation you receive constantly from the Earth, the Sun, the stars, buildings, and our own bodies. Okay, and we get an amount of that per year that we we give it a number. We say we get three milli gray. GY, capital G, little y, is a unit of radiation called the gray. And I'll just write it up here so we can remember it. So if I want to ask you, if you want to ask uh, how much radiation was I exposed to in this incident, right? I would say you were exposed to X amount of grays of radiation, X, some, some amount of grays of radiation. In a year, you get three milli gray worth of radiation. Milli gray milli just means 
one one thousandth of something. Okay, it's so like a millimeter is one one thousandth of a meter, right? A milli gray is one one thousandth of a gray. Um, to give you a, a frame of reference for this, All right, so if you were exposed at your whole body, so not just like your hand or something, but if your whole body was exposed to one gray of radiation, you could die, okay? In a year, you get three milligrays worth of radiation just from the natural background. So it'd take a, lot, a long time to, to accumulate enough to, to die, and, 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 and you'll learn that accumulating that radiation over long periods of time negates the effect of the radiation. So if I gave it to you all at once, you could die. One gray all at once, you could definitely die. Three milligrays per year is not enough to do anything close to that. That's what I was reading on, because I, I remember you saying that, and then I was trying to figure out, like, okay, go on sleep. So you mean, like, one milligray in one shot? No, one gray in one shot. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you'd have to get, you know, roughly a thousand times more than your, your yearly dose, right? 300-ish times more than your yearly dose all at once in order to potentially die. And you could still survive it. Um, one gray is the, the, the human death threshold. Like nobody's gonna die really from a whole body exposure of less than one gray and somebody could die above one gray. Now there's numbers higher than that where you'll definitely die, right? right. But um, one gray is kind of the range at which we say bad things can happen. You can't make anything close to one gray in the x-ray room, okay? And even if you could, you can't open your x-ray beam big enough to expose the entire body, okay? So there's no harm or risk of doing this to your patients, okay? You can't kill your patients with the x-ray machine, unless you, like, drop it on them or something like that. <laughs> I'm thinking, I, I'm just giving you guys the food for thought. <laughs> All right, um, questions? No? Okay, let's keep going. So that's your, that's your natural background dose, right? You have three milligray-ish per year. Um, I forget if it's in this lecture or not, because I do a lot of lectures, um, if we break down where that, what the sources are. But anyways, three milligray per year is our natural background. Let's, um, let's give uh, and some, more, you know, some more food for reference here. Um, it's so in, in x-ray terms, if you took 15 front view AP chest x-rays on somebody, um, so just made 15 exposures one after the one after the other all at once. That would give them a, a year's worth of natural background at one instance. Okay, that's 15. That's not that many. I mean, you take two at a time, right? One patient gets two. You can imagine having a few repeats on that patient, right? You can imagine uh, the training X-ray tech forgets to monitor you and you accidentally take, you know. 13 repeats, so you take 15 images, right? So you can imagine, like, it's not that far out of the imagination where you could, in principle, give somebody a year's worth of natural background just in chest x-rays. You're not going to do it, right? But in principle, in practice, it's never going to happen. You're never going to take 15 chest x-rays. Um, someone would stop you, right? Um, but that's the idea, okay? Give you some more frame of reference. A suntan gives you more radiation exposure than a chest x-ray does, okay? So it is more dangerous for you to go out on the beach and go tan for an hour or two than it is to go to the doctor's office and get your chest x-ray, okay? So chest x-ray is not that harmful. You'd need at least 15 of them to, to equal just the natural background uh, radiation. That's not a lot. Your natural background is very, very minimal, three milligray. Um, in risk assessment terms, it's equivalent to driving uh, four or five miles or smoking a few cigarettes. So it's not that harmful, right? Let's compare this to uh, some other things. Uh, and uh, front view, so AP is the term for front view in, in radiography, okay? Uh, it stands for anterior posterior, but it's not really important right now. AP means front view, okay? Um, an AP view of the abdomen, the tummy, okay? Uh, would give a person about three to five milligray. That's, but importantly, that's not to the whole body. Okay, what we're going to learn in, uh, later in upcoming modules is that, you know, one, so, so three to five milligray to the abdomen is not the same thing as three to five milligray to the entire body. Okay, three to five milligray to the whole body is more radiation. All right, we'll learn that in upcoming stuff. But anyways, 
Three to five milligray to the abdomen is about the same as the annual background dose. Okay, so getting one abdomen X-ray is kind of this is kind of similar to a year's worth of natural background. So it's like adding one year of natural background radiation onto that patient's life. Okay, so the point is is that it's not it's not immediately harmful, but it's not immediately discountable either. It's a measurable amount of radiation you're giving to your patients and different exams give more or less, you know? An abdomen study is similar to like a lumbar spine study. You guys do lumbar spines, right? A single lumbar spine is in the same neighborhood as a year's worth of natural background radiation for your patients, right? So a physician has to consider that. Is the information I might get from the x-ray, the physician's inf information the physician might get, worth giving that patient about a year's more, a year more of natural background radiation. That's of course, if it's one of these, you know, abdominal exams or something like that, chest x-rays are of course less. But the point is, is that it's a measurable amount of radiation. Okay, so we have to, you know, really consider that when we, um, when physicians order uh, images and when we produce those images. All right, um, let's look at a table here that might help us a little bit. So, um, I think it's big enough. Hopefully you guys can see that. So on this table, you'll see different columns. On the left column, you'll see names of procedures or things, sources of radiation. One column over, you'll see the amount of exposure associated with that thing. And then over here, these last three columns on the right, you'll see equivalent in risk. Okay, so they give you examples of cigarettes, smoked. We know cigarettes can be harmful. Driving is harmful, and then there's background radiation over here. So let's look at um, let's look at single chest X-ray. So a single chest X-ray gives a patient about 0.2 milligray. So not two milligray, 0.2 milligray. Okay, it's equivalent to smoking two cigarettes. So if your patient has two cigarettes instead of a chest X-ray, they got about the same amount of of, of absorbed risk. Okay, if they drove to the office that was just as risky as getting the chest x-ray as far as risk to your health, okay? <laughs> and that single chest x-ray equals about three weeks of natural background, roughly speaking. How's the driving more risky than a cigarette? Well, driving six kilometers, so it's per kilometer, right? Um, this is just a number of cigarettes. So there's a way, I don't have the way, but there's a way of, of comparing risk. Right, comparing the risk of driving to the risk of smoking a cigarette, right? Car crash, yeah, yeah, so that's that's why that's what driving is. It's not saying a car crash because a car crash is going to cause harm, right? Driving puts you at risk for having one of those, right? So that's the risky activity is driving, right? Every six miles, <laughs> right? Exactly. So, so kilometers, right? Kilometers. So drive drive three kilometers. That's the same risk to you as smoking a single cigarette, right? Okay. So let's look at Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island, the people around Three Mile Island, the closest people to it, got an exposure of 0 0.015 milligray. Not 0 0.015 gray, 0 0.015 milligray. A teensy tiny amount of exposure. 15 microgray. Micro is one millionth. So 15 millionths of one gray. It's almost too low to really care about, right? It's equivalent in risk to those people of smoking a quarter of a cigarette, okay? So it wasn't risky at all, right? Everyone here has probably taken a quarter, smoked a quarter of a cigarette. Most people try one at some point in their lives, right? You, you uh, took on as much risk when you did that as um, the people around Three Mile Island. It's equivalent to driving a half of a kilometer or two days of natural background. 365 days in a year, those per people got 367 days worth of natural background that year. Okay, so really nothing, right? Almost negligible, yeah? Let's move down and look at, um, let's go down to a barium enema. A barium enema is one of the highest level radiography, uh, ra radiographic procedures. Uh, it's not the, it's one of the highest levels. There are definitely ones higher than this. A uh, barium enema is a type of image that um, produces uh, contrast of the body. We can see the, the colon outlined with this stuff called barium, okay? The amount of exposure associated with that is 120 to 150 milligray, okay? So it's, it's, it's up there. It's a measurable amount in grays. Equivalent in risk to smoking 1,200 cigarettes. So that's, that's a lot, right? That's a lot of uh, exposure. It's equivalent to driving 4,800 kilometers or 40 years of natural background. 
So getting a single barium enema study adds 40 years worth of natural background radiation amount onto the body, but all at one time, okay? You'll learn later that if I offered you to receive an amount of radiation over the next year, or I said I can give it all to you all at once, right? You'll learn that getting it all at once is worse, right? Spreading it out over a long period of time is better, okay? So, but they get that 40 years worth all at one time, okay? Now it's not to the whole body, that's gonna be important. It's to a portion of the body, but still, that's a lot, right? 40 years worth of extra natural background. Um, let's compare that to the worst case nuclear disasters that we've had. There's two. There's uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki in, at the end of World War II, okay? Uh, they just talk about Hiroshima here. And then there is Chernobyl in, in the 80s, okay? So this is the mid-40s, Chernobyl's in the 80s. Uh, Chernobyl survivors received 450 milligray. Notice what it says, Chernobyl survivors okay the people that died at chernobyl got way more than that and they died really really bad deaths okay uh, but people who survived that received about half of a gray equivalent to 3600 cigarettes smoked 14,000 kilometers but get this 150 years of natural background okay the people at chernobyl got a lot of radiation exposure all in one incident and then continued for as long as they stayed in, 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 in that uh, town. There was a town next to it called Pripyat, and then there's, of course, the power plant of Chernobyl. Um, and people who stayed there uh, got it you know, more and more and more as, as the longer that they stayed. Some people, by the way, never evacuated. Some people refused to evacuate, and there's actually people still living there today in the exclusion zones. It's like two people, yeah. Uh, it might be, it's, it's at least two old people, but it might be more than that. I, I, I definitely have seen a documentary where it talks, that they interview the two people. Um, sounds like you might have seen the same yeah. one. Um, uh, and Hiroshima, right? This is, this is the, the, the mid 40s, like 45 or whatever, whenever World War II ends, right? Um, 2,000 milligray, that's two gray, okay? People survived more than the amount that could have killed them, okay? Remember, one gray can kill you, okay? can not will but can people survived two gray okay now those people received so much radiation all at once that um they're going to have adverse effects you know adverse health effects later on in life they're going to pass down adverse effects to their children through genetic mutations that they'll have um and so there's there's ongoing stuff leukemia and things like that ongoing in the in that population but in that instance of 2,000 milligray, you know, by the way, 100,000 people, when this happened, Hiroshima bomb was dropped, 100,000 people gone like that, just vaporized, okay? The ones who survived probably had it worse, though, okay? Because they had to deal with all these terrible health effects, right? If you're dead, you're just dead, right? But if you're alive and dealing with horrible health effects, right, that might, in some, you could argue that that's worse. Anyways, 16,000 cigarettes smoked in equivalent risk, 64,000 kilometers driven in equivalent risk. But this is the important one I think that's impactful. 700 years worth of natural background all at once to their whole bodies, okay? So very bad, not a good, not a, not, not a good thing at all. This was a, a, a horrible disaster. And you'll notice, has anyone dropped nuclear bombs on anyone since then? No, because we realize, oh, that wasn't good, right? <laughs> I mean, what did it do? It stopped World War II like that right but it was a worldwide disaster right it was horrible that we did it one of the worst things that pe humans have ever ever done okay and the united states did it right so it happened though we can't take that back um but we learned yeah, from it right huh they, they did and they didn't want to stop what they started but you may be, I'm not going to go into it, but we might, we may be able to argue that there might have been other ways of handling it than dropping ridiculously sized nuclear bombs on civilian populations. That's, that's where my beef comes from is the civilian part of it, you know, but anyway, anyways, um, we can, I think we can probably all agree that it was definitely a disaster regardless. Right. Um, so there you go. That's, and by the way, where we pull all of like our data on that we're going to talk about over the next, you know, several lectures on, um, you know, we, we got num we, we numbers of how many people, uh, we're exposed to certain amounts of radiation and what happens from that. Most of the studies, most of the data that we talk about comes from Chernobyl and, and the Hiroshima incidences, right? Because these are the big incidences that happen to people that we can now take data from, okay? Uh, so a lot of what we talk about is pulled from that. Okay, let's move on. I would like to go now to, sorry, I'm hesitating um 
I'd like to talk briefly about um, some historical development. So those are some bad things that have happened. We were able to compare, uh, you know, risk of certain things to things that have happened or things that we do, like create images. But anyways, we want to learn, you know, um, x-rays are harmful. We learned that they're harmful pretty early on, and we started this whole lecture off by talking about Clarence Dow Daly's death in 1904. So we made advancements since then, okay? These are equipment advancements for the most part. Um, Remember, x-rays discovered in 1895. So 1896, Edison, who invents the fluoroscope, also invents something called an intensifying screen. And the way to think about it is, um, how did we produce x-ray images back then? Well, there was a photographic film, a piece of photographic film that you put inside a cardboard wrapper, okay? And you put it on one side of a person, and then you shot the x-ray beam through the person, and the photographic film got exposed, okay? The x-ray beam exposes the photographic film. All right, x-ray exposures took a long time to produce, minutes of time. The patient would have to sit still for minutes of time. Uh, Rentkin's first image, he's, his wife had to sit still for four minutes. The, the picture we'll see in later ones of, of uh, Rentkin's wife's hand, she had to sit still for four minutes for that exposure. Had to, the machine was turned on for four full minutes. And you learned um, that you know long exposure times make risk for patient motion, right? Um, back then they would have to have held still for minutes at a time, not, not milliseconds at a time. But anyways, um, Edison invents something called an intensifying screen. The intensifying screen is the idea that, you know, you've got a piece of film, right? And that film goes inside of a, of a cardboard jacket like that, right? So, and, and the x-rays would pass through the jacket and expose the film. The x-rays would expose the film. Edison invents something that could coat the inside of the jacket. And then when the jacket's closed, on the inside of the jacket, when the um, x-ray beam hits the, the, the uh, cassette, the thing that the film is in, the inside of the film, the inside of the jacket for the, the film is in the, would light up, okay? The screen, the intensifying screen would light up, the screen would expose the photographic film, okay? So it's not the x-ray beam exposing the film anymore, it is x-rays strike something called the intensifying screen on the inside of the jacket of the cassette, and that emits light and that exposes the film, okay? intensifying screens. That reduced patient exposure by, you know, magnitudes. It reduced patient exposure quite a lot. Um, screen cassettes in 1896, which is basically just having um, that same intensifying screen put inside of the cassette, sort of as I was just talking about. Beam filtration and restriction. We've talked a little bit about filtration. Restriction is just taking the beam which would normally be emitted in all directions like a light bulb, right, and coning it down to only go in the direction we want it to go in, okay? That's 1899. Filtration and restriction are done by a guy named William Rollins. William Rollins is a dentist, okay? He, he's the one you can credit for, you know, these things being attached to dental x-ray tubes, right? This thing that goes up against your mouth like that, right? This is the collimator for a dental x-ray tube. It's just a cylinder, right? He invents these in 1899. 1942, someone named Russell Morgan invents automatic exposure control. AEC gives you the, uh, a way to get the right amount of exposure each time without you having to control it. The machine can shut itself off once the right amount of exposure hits an image receptor. Uh, fluoroscopic image intensifiers, 1948. This is part of a fluoroscopy machine. Rare earth phosphor intensifying screens, 1972. These are just better intensifying screens. So 1896, Edison invents the thing called the intensifying screen. 1972, we get a better one. And then the 90s, we get digital radiography coming online. Okay, Digital radiography was a way of taking our images and having them produced and displayed on a computer screen rather than having them be a piece of film that you put on a view box. Okay? And we kept film for a long time. Film is now almost entirely phased out. There are very, very few facilities that still use film. I don't partner with any of them anymore because I don't, I don't know any that still use film. I know they have to exist because uh, there's people out there that still service film equipment, okay? But it's becoming much rarer. I'm sure you still have those, those, hold, those physicians that are holding out though. Okay. Do they just, um, do they have to replace the whole setup or can they just, is it modular where they can take the, the film 
mechanics out and replace it with the digital? Um, yeah, it's, it's modular. Yeah, you just pull out all the film stuff. Um, so all you need for film, right, you need the photographic film. right? So you need the film. You need film cassettes, right? And then you need a processor, right? The processor is just a wet film processor that drags the film through it and produces the processed film image. If you remove those things and then just bring in a digital system, there's no... You don't have to do anything to your x-ray machine, which is nice. Your x-ray machine can work the same, you know, depending on... Uh, I, yeah. saw the, I saw that, you know, my first... Uh, Experience cardiac cath. Mm -hmm. They actually took the films out and developed them. They had to develop them in the room. Yeah. They'd take them in, you know, close off yeah, the room. Yeah, dark room. Turn on the black light and, and process the film. Yeah, you and know, it takes time. takes time, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, time, and then you got to make sure you're, you know, you're, you have you have developer, you have fixer, you have a wash tank, right? These these chemicals have to be in the right temperatures, in the right quantities. They have to be serviced regularly. Um, film had a lot of problems with it, but it was um, you still cannot achieve better resolution than than film. Film has the best resolution of any type of imaging. Um, it just happens that it, it's it's. Uh, Kind of getting phased out. The things that the DR systems that we have now can produce almost equivalent images in resolution, better than the human eye can differentiate, but give you more contrast uh, resolution too. So, uh, sort of, we're phasing out for lots of different reasons. Okay. So, um, let's take one last look back at Three Mile Island and compared to Chernobyl. Okay. So remember we said Three Mile Island emitted 17 curies? And we gave it in, in the, that table you saw, you know, the exposure to those people around the Three Mile Island, how much they actually received. But if you want to talk about how much radiation a source of radiation emits, you'll use the unit of curie, okay? Three Mile Island emits 17 curies of radiation. Chernobyl emits 50 million curies of radiation. So not 50, but 50 million. Quite a bit more, okay? Chernobyl was a real disaster. Three Mile Island was a made-up disaster, okay? It happened. It's not great. M nuclear power plant had a meltdown and emitted radiation into the environment, but such low levels when compared to any of these other major disasters. Um, let's see here. Uh, total core meltdown at Chernobyl uh, in Russia uh, will eventually be responsible for at least 5,000 early deaths in Eastern Europe. Again, a true environmental catastrophe. There's people that died in the actual um, incident and, and within days after. Um, and But 5,000 people are credited with dying earlier than they should have, right? Early, early deaths. Good. Um, if you're interested, if, if this Chernobyl it, it all interests you, there's a bunch of really, really good documentary footage on this. Um, there's a docudrama that they made from it, which is actually toned down compared to what actually happened. The actual docudrama that they filmed um, is not as bad as what actually happened. Um, and so I, if, I encourage you to look into this kind of stuff if it interests you at all. There's plenty of information about these things. Um, okay. So... This is the last frame of reference slide I have. So um, the atomic bombs, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we learned that the average exposure to survivors was too gray, okay? And to give us a little bit of a frame of reference than that, oh, and by the way, those atomic bombs uh, were um, fission bombs, okay? These were a different type of bomb, okay? The bombs we have nowadays have thousands of times more explosive power, explosive energy than, than what Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those two fat man and little boy bombs had. Um, anyways, so if it happens today, it's going to be a much, much worse thing than, than, um, than, that's why, that's why we have, you know, big worries about what's happening, like Russia, Ukraine, and the United States' position with that, our position with other places, other superpowers like China. We worry about those things because the, the nuclear weapons we have nowadays would be, you know, the mutually assured destruction kind, right? Where we all die, right? Not a good thing. Um, so, yeah, um, but that was the uh, concept proof. The proof of concept was the Hiroshima Nagasaki thing. Anyways, too gray to the survivors. We learned a little moment, you know, a little while ago, and I put it on the board, but more than one gray to the whole body, that's enough to cause some deaths. Somebody could die from that. Three and a half to four gray is an, enough radiation to be lethal to half of a population. 
okay? Um, you'll learn later, but I'll just say it now. Three and a half to four gray is what we call the LD5030, okay? LD stands for lethal dose. 50-30 stands for 50% 50 of the population within 30 days, okay? So if you take a, a population of people and give them all three and a half to four gray to the entire body, half of that population will die within 30 days. Okay, that's the LD5030. Seven gray or more to the whole body is the LD100, lethal death to 100% of the population. Nobody's surviving that, at least statistically. I think we will quote a number later, but I think there was like somebody, they don't say who, but some person is, is, is um, said to have survived like eight or nine gray. Okay, so somebody lived through it, but statistically everyone will expire at above seven gray. I like how they say expire instead of die. They mean die. <laughs> TikTok what? You can't say death? You can't say die. Hmm. Interesting. Because it's... Yeah. Can you, can you say... You're supposed to say unalive? Yeah, unalive. Is that why people say unalive? That's exactly right. <laughs> Is, that's so stupid it's just a word i mean we all, we're all gonna die yeah, yeah. <laughs> not today but we're all gonna die <laughs> hopefully i don't know i know. i'm in i'm in the the you know uh, frame of mind that there just shouldn't be a tiktok but that's just my opinion <laughs> i don't like you know how you can learn recipes though you could just Google recipe. <laughs> I know, I, I know, I know, I know the, I know the, uh, I know the,